Hi everyone, pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Excited to be speaking about payment metrics that matter the most. Brief introduction about myself, I'm Waheed, one of the strategic account managers here at Paddle. My expertise is really around payments and revenue. That's both giving it in, and then also make sure you don't lose it on the other end. Wanted to paint a brief picture about who we work with as well. So make sure of B2C and B2B companies, downloadable software and also online web SaaS. Uh, MacPo is a name you might recognize. We actually help them make the transition from a one-time billing model to subscription, and then doing so achieve the 70% annual renewal rate. Something we're really proud of here at Paddle. With that said, today's topic. So we'll be talking about payment acceptance, chargebacks and churn. Please, throughout the presentation, do submit your questions via the Q&A panel. We'll try our best to answer as many of them towards the end as possible. Now with payment acceptance, what we're gonna be talking about is the importance of payment acceptance, merger record versus gateway, and what are the strategies that you can do in order to improve your payment acceptance. With payment acceptance, it's all about capturing as much money up front as it is possible. This isn't about customers who are going to the checkout and then clicking buy. This is people who finish the checkout, they've entered all of their payment details, and that's the number of attempts we're actually calculating. It's a lot easier to capture those customers and make sure you're doing a good job with them, as opposed to recovering someone who's dropped off or recovering someone who's turned. And it's also important when you're a subscription-based company, you wanna make sure the customers that agree to pay can keep paying you. If you're a subscription company, every billing interval, let's say monthly, is a chance where your customers drop off because of your low payment acceptance rate. Now, no one unfortunately has 100% payment success. However, it's something that to hopefully with today's strategies, you can work to get closer towards. There's a number of reasons that also go into why they fail. Not all of them are listed here, but they really mainly come down to three buckets, customer issues, process issues, and also risk-based. Today, we're gonna to be talking about customer and processor-led issues. So as we mentioned, Payment acceptance about the number of successful payments over a number of attempted payments, not how many people click the buy button. But you also wanna be a bit careful just using that metric. It's not about the aggregate. There's a lot of different ways to look at payment acceptance. You have your initial checkout, a subscription renewals, a monthly versus annual plan, payment methods, geographies, or the value. All of them have a different impact on your payment acceptance rate, and it's important to look at that nuance. In fact, two websites with the same products at the same price point could have a different payment acceptance rate because of a different customer profile. Now, we mentioned processor issues as one of the main reasons that payments fail. And we're gonna talk about merchant records versus gateways here. So with a payment gateway, we all know them, they're responsible for getting money from person A to person B. Now, this is important and the online internet wouldn't uh, be able to handle payments without them. However, with a merchant record, the relationship's a bit different. The merchant of records is the one maintaining the relationships with all of the underlying gateways, and then they're responsible for the transaction of the end customer, not yourself. What this means is you get to benefit from their magnitude of scale. So a merchant record will typically have different local merchant accounts around the world, versus a gateway where you have to do this um, work yourself, setting up entities in different countries. We'll touch on the impact of that in a second. The next part is also volume of transactions. Now you could be doing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions a month, which is awesome. And the more transactions, the more reliability you have with your underlying processes, and that means a higher payment acceptance. However, Merchant Record will have thousands of customers that are doing such volumes. So their reliability will be much higher than yours at any point in time. Having that many transactions going through that company as well will also mean they're able to do smart reading of transactions. Customer in California using Chase Bank is very different to a customer in New Zealand using an ANZ bank account. Being able to route these transactions through the appropriate gateways will be able to bump up your payment acceptance rate. Now you can build this yourself, but it's a lot of engineering burden that is taking away your resource from your product team. The next part is also supporting relationships with different PSPs. We all know what being a key account for any company is like. There's better service, better reliability, a merchant record will tend to be the key account for different PSPs. This is something that you as an end seller will benefit from greatly. And that benefit also ties into tracking of payment data. The above split down of different ways to look at payment acceptance, it's really difficult to get self-serve from the payment gateway. However, because a merchant record is a key account for these gateways, we're able to meet with our, um, our own account managers with the underlying gateways and PSPs at least once a month to dive into exactly that detail, understand what's working and what's not, and then be able to make the appropriate adjustments, allowing you to have a better payment acceptance rate. 
that said, what can you do today in order to improve your payment acceptance? One of them is using a payment method with a direct source of funds. So that's, for example, using PayPal. The reason being is with PayPal, the money is moving from one account to another within the same ecosystem. Whereas when you go ahead with a card network, even though it may be more popular in certain countries, there's a lot of people involved in the middle where you could drop off your payment acceptance. In fact, we've actually seen double the payment acceptance rate with a digital wallet, such as PayPal, versus using a normal card payment. This is also important for wire transfers, where if you're transferring anything above a large amount, for example, from dollars a thousand dollars, then with a wire transfer, your odds of success are much higher, and there's also a lot less middlemen um, at play here. The next part of this is group payments through local acquirers. Now, I mentioned this earlier that Emerge Record already has this infrastructure set up. The reason this has benefit to you as a company is think about the relationship between different banks. It's much more likely that a German bank will have a relationship with the other German bank than it will with a bank in China. In setting up and using local acquirers, you're able to boost up your payment acceptance rate because of this dynamic relationship that they have between each other. In fact, we tried um, different customers paying in the US, AB testing them with a US bank account um, and a non-US bank account, and we saw 20% improvement in payment acceptance rate. This is 20% of customers are trying to pay you, but they're unable to do so. And now with local currencies. So anyone working with me knows how much I speak about local currencies can improve your conversion rate. It's a bit of a no-brainer for me personally, but the other thing is that it actually benefits you from a payment acceptance standpoint. We see that when you charge with a local currency, you're improving your payment acceptance rate between one and 9%. This is one to 9% of every billing interval as well if you're a subscription company. So the magnitude of improvement to your bottom line is tremendous. With that said, there's a lot more we can talk about payment acceptance, but unfortunately we don't have time for today. So the metrics you want to go away and look at though after this webinar is net payment acceptance, initial checkout payment acceptance, and then what's your renewal payment acceptance rate. These numbers will help you paint a picture to see if you have a tooling problem and maybe you need to change different processes. From there, we're gonna talk about chargebacks. So we'll talk about the different types of fraud, a case study where we managed to bring down someone's chargeback rate from 3%, and also what different fraud processes should look like. I'm really passionate about chargebacks personally, and the reason being is that there is a tremendous cost on you as a business dealing with chargebacks. A lot of people are aware of the chargeback fee and the loss of the transaction amount. However, that's not just it. There's a product and service cost. You know, your company is creating these products and delivering them to your customers. That's obviously a burden on you and your servers and so forth. But then there's also an operational cost. How much of your support team are dealing with these chargeback queries? How, do you have a built-out fraud team when maybe you shouldn't have? I tend to ask my customers when they work with us, how many people do you have in your fraud team? If they're processing less than a million dollars in GMB a month, then the, any answer more than one person is too much. And this is why that fraud is something that is super important to tackle so that you can allocate resource to what actually earns you money. There's three different types of fraud. There's true fraud, which is why chargebacks exist. Someone stole your credit card, they made the payment, and then you as the owner of that credit card to file a chargeback claim. There's friendly fraud, and this is probably the easiest area to tackle. We'll talk about a couple of things you can do here. And that's mainly customers who are confused, unhappy with the service, or just forgot that they had a subscription, for example. Then there's chargeback fraud. And these are people abusing the chargeback system in order to benefit. We've seen everything from people using the product to then not wanting to pay for it, so they file a chargeback claim and customers who are actually even reselling the different products they buy and then filing a chargeback so they have a net gain with no cost as a business, if you can even call it that. Now fraud, I'd like to split out into a bit further detail. You have initial payments for subscriptions, different payment methods, and also do they go through two-factor authentication or 3D secure? The reason I like to split out in this way is the different tactics and different solutions you have at hand will differ depending on the split. So ProxyRack is a company that we were quite proud of the work we did together. Um, they spent a lot of time on their end trying to tackle this problem as they got kicked from one gateway to another, um, and eventually landing with Palette, we would proactively work with them in order to bring this chart book rate down. Really proud of the work we did here. As you can see, it went from 3.2% to 0.43% within three quarters. Um, I actually checked their chargeback rate uh, just last week. 
and there's 0.34 percent so even lower than that and there's a few things that we did here so proxy rack mainly had issues with chargeback fraud and friendly fraud with friendly fraud there was a reputational issue proxies is a high risk industry there's a lot of dodgy providers out there and proxy rack were neglecting that online reputation they had a lot of reviews on their trust pilot on other websites claiming that it was a bad service obviously this causes a lot of distrust within your community if for example someone bought a subscription wanted to file a refund and then they see this review they're much more likely to not wait for that refund outcome and actually go and file a chargeback claim so working on a number of different ways the initial thing we wanted to do was segment how many of these are legitimate reviews and how many of these are false reviews with proxy rack, I realized a large number of them were false reviews. There were their competitors attacking them, trying to bring down the reputation so that customers would go to their website. We started filing reports against these false reviews in order to remove them from the different review sites. From there, we started a campaign as well to contact all the happy customers. Let's get them speaking because the picture that was painted wasn't an accurate one. Proxy is a successful business. You can't be successful without happy customers. Thankfully, this campaign worked massively. Um, there's a lot of five-star reviews now on the Proxy Rack uh, Trustpilot page, for example. In fact, they're even using that on their landing page on the website in order to build trust and legitimacy to people who are visiting them for the first time, which obviously helps increase your sales. This is a simple tactic that it takes a few weeks to tackle, but that pays off in lots of ways. From there, we also wanted to deal with clarifying the value and price. Initially, this is what Proxy Rack's pricing page looked like. It was confusing, there was no actual price points, the benefits of the different plans were unclear, and the CTA was actually inaccurate. As it said to click here for plan, the next step was actually a sign up page, which people tended to go through because lots of frustration, and this built up frustration meant people were more likely to file a chargeback claim. Working with them, we actually revamped their pricing page. Pricing was now much more upfront, we're a lot clearer in terms of what's the value proposition of each different plan, and the CTA was a lot more accurate. This clarity and the improvements to their reputation helped us bring down their friendly fraud to near zero. From there, though, we wanted to tackle the chargeback problem of chargeback fraud. So one of the important things is that when you're using a payment service provider or a merchant record, you want to make sure that you're collecting payments from the legitimate customers only allow people who want to pay you for the right reasons through and block everyone else. Our product team let me share this map with you. This is what Paddle's fraud flow tends to look like. And I want to speak about three different parts. The first is the initial diamond BL after checkout. This is our internal blacklist. The odds of someone committing fraud once wanting to commit fraud again is incredibly high. So anytime we find that someone is abusing the systems, across any of our sellers, we add them to our comprehensive blacklist. This means even if they get to a checkout, we're gonna block them, we're not gonna even let them get a chance to commit fraud. The next part here that I wanna talk about is the circle and triangle, FS and third. We use a mixture of our own internal tooling and third party tools. It's important to maintain that dynamic because there's a lot of different industry trends that relate to your area of business. For us and Paddle, our focus is on software sales. So we're constantly reviewing the different trends that go on in software sales fraud. These third party tools, however, are also purpose built for that. So they're on the industry cutting edge of what fraud is going on in. And so using the mixture together, we're able to really filter out and block their appropriate transactions. The next part of this is also the liability shift in which you see the great rectangle. With any 3D secure or two-factor authentication based transaction, you're actually no longer liable for any fraud related to that. The liabilities on your bank, the processors, and so forth. This is super important because it means even if you got a chargeback, that doesn't count against your own chargeback rate, and it doesn't mean money loss. You don't have to pay any chargeback fees, for example. So it's a huge cost saver for you as a company. You obviously want to make sure that you only route the appropriate transactions through so you'd be secure because it has an impact on conversion rate. That's something we can talk about at a different point. Now, there's a number of trends you want to analyze when it comes to fraud. You want to look at geographic trends, email trends, payment profile, even customer behavior. We've seen people with subscription plans where 
they only run KYC on certain upper price plans where the fraudsters actually buy the cheaper ones then upgrade to the most expensive before committing chargeback fraud. And we also want to look at device fingerprinting. All of these trends variate and evolve. In fact, we tend to see about every 30 to 60 days fraud trends change. Because of this, tackling fraud will be a constant iterative process. It's not just about implementing a solution or a tool one-off. Um, in fact, all of the tooling that Paddle uses um, is constantly evolving as using different machine learning algorithms. We also want to talk about chargeback disputes. So I mentioned with 3D Secure that you're not liable for any of these chargebacks. You're also able to dispute a chargeback when you do get one. Now, what this means is that when a chargeback claim comes through, you're able to provide evidence in order to say, actually, this is an illegitimate claim. With ProxyRec, for example, the data we provided was showing how many subscription renewals the customer had paid for, showing login data for their user account, and showing product usage data. The combination of those three things meant we were able to achieve an above industry average chargeback dispute success rate. The thing to keep in mind is that if you are using a payment gateway, this will drop your chargeback rate. It will just mean you're saving money. Um, I'm not sure about other payment merchant records, but with Paddle, we actually drop your chargeback rate um, in our calculations if you're winning a lot more of these chargebacks. Now, what are the metrics you want to look at? Obviously, chargeback rates are very important still, but you also want to look at how many of these chargebacks are service related. How many of them are because of friendly fraud? As that has a massive impact in terms of the strategy you use to deal with the problem. And then you want to look at your chargeback win rate. How much money are you leaving on the table that you could have otherwise reacquired and put back into your business? And now churn and refunds. So we're going to talk about different types of churn. And we're going to talk about what some tactics you can use in order to recover these um, payments. Again, it's really important to understand why we're focusing on churn. A customer who you prevent from canceling their subscription in month one may pay you for month two, three, four. That's a lot more money and a lot more of an improved lifetime value of this customer than you would have otherwise had with a meaningful impact, especially as a subscription business, across your bottom line. There's two types of churn. There's voluntary, voluntary churn, which we're all quite familiar with. This is customers actually choosing to cancel. And then there's involuntary churn. This is churn from failed payments. So for example, from a poor payment acceptance rate. We're going to talk about different things you can do in both areas. You also want to be mindful as a company about pre-churn tactics and post-churn tactics. Today, we won't be able to talk too much about the nuance of the two, but that's something definitely to go back and research afterwards. When you map out your pre-churn, post-churn events, your voluntary and involuntary churn, you end up with a bit of a map of what strategies you have at hand. If you can dig really deep into what types of churn you have, you're able to identify where should your areas of improvement be. And this is a really good guide in order to help with that. Um, to paint a picture of scale as well, Typically, 20 to 40% of churn is involuntary. If you're seeing a number much higher than that, then you want to look at in terms of your processor and you want to understand what's going on here because that would might be much higher than industry average. With involuntary churn, there's a few different tactics here in play. Um, one thing to point out is look at the way we're looking at these numbers. With done in campaigns, we look at 10% less churn. With card dollar update, we look at 3% less monthly churn. The, this is 3% of revenue, 10% of revenue that you're earning and keeping as a company. This means improved ROI um, on your sales and marketing efforts and improved lifetime value from these paying customers. Let's talk about what these specific campaigns can actually look like. This is an example of email dunning that Paddle provides out of the box. When the customer's payment fails, we don't just cancel the subscription. We send them a few follow-up emails asking them to update their payment information. It's really important to be clear here. What are they paying for? How much are they going to pay? And then what do they do to pay? The CTA is nice and clear, update payment information. From that point, potentially it doesn't work. It won't work with all of your customers. The next step is to pause the subscription. Do not cancel. And the difference being is that when you pause the subscription, you're retaining their payment information on the hand so that when they do come back, and you can see this with the second email with our pause campaign, they can one click hit restart subscription 
and their payments start again. This is especially important because one of the biggest reasons for involuntary churn is lack of funds in their account. So in you giving them this window to update their payment details or actually add funds to their account, you're able to recover this customer with a lot less friction than them having to go through an entire checkout all over again. This is an example of doing this in a more proactive way via user accounts if you have that. Again, it's about clear messaging, clear color coding, and making it very easy for the customer to know where to go to update their payment details. I would suggest doing this both within your product and then also if you have any user management area, if it's decoupled from your product, for example, with de downloadable software, making sure you have prompts in both of these areas. You don't have to remove access from the product immediately. You can see in this example, access is still active. Um, building that kind of trust and reliability and kind of giving people the benefit of the doubt can sometimes pay off um, in terms of the customer wanting to keep paying you. From there, update expiring cards. Now, card issuers mandate that you have to a, a card has to expire after three years, and because of that, about three percent of your card's payments every month are probably um, unable to pay for the subscription as normal. What can, you can actually do here is there's some tooling in place to allow you auto update these card details. What that means is you're actually contacting their local bank or card issuer to get the newer expiry date, the newer CVV, newer card number, whatever it may be. Not all card networks allow for this. However, it's something that you put on, it runs in the background, saves you a lot of money in the long run. You don't have to think about it too much. We mentioned that sometimes the reason for payment failure is a lack of funds. Because of this, you wanna make sure you have a payment done in sequence. And this is multiple attempts to charge that same payment method over a period of time. This is giving your customer the time and window to add the funds to their account especially important for B2C type products. You can see here now we have four different attempts in order to recover that payment. And then at the very end, we, we pause the subscription. We tend to see that as each different company will need to experiment with this cadence, how many days do you have in between the retries, how many numbers of retries do you do? The important thing is that you have it in place in whatever shape or form it is. Now let's talk about voluntary churn. Voluntary churn, as we mentioned, tend to make up the majority of your churn rate, and therefore the impact of it is a lot higher. Voluntary churn is also one of the things that's a lot easier for you to build and handle. It's a lot less about what tooling you have in place, but it's a lot more about what funnels you create. Framer is an example of this. Where framers are utilizing our parallel by supporting in a really interesting way. Whenever we receive a refund or cancellation request, we actually ask for the reason for that cancellation refund, and then try upsell with a 50% discount to an annual plan. Now 50% might seem like a lot, but keep in mind, this is someone who wanted to stop paying you. So any money from them is a net gain. And what this is doing is you're switching a churning customer into a paying one. And the benefit of using an annual plan is that you actually have a much longer window where this customer may, one, see the benefit of your product, two, actually need your product at a future point. And both of those things mean that they might are more likely to renew in a year's time. Again, that's money you wouldn't have otherwise had, and it's much easier for a customer to just let something renew than have to go back to your website and into their payment information. This is an email recovery example. So this is after someone has chosen to cancel their subscription, Iconosquare, a B2B SaaS company with Paddle, send out these sequences. And it's really important to keep in mind that you're reminding the customer why they're paying. Not that they cancelled. You talk about the value proposition of what your product offers. In fact, some really intelligent companies right now, what they're doing is they're tracking product usage of a churned customer and then creating an email cadence based on the product features that the customer hasn't used. And that way, making sure that if a customer missed part of your value proposition, the email campaign will help them show, see that. Um, another thing to realize here, it's not asking for them to pay now, it's asking for them to add a business profile. The reason this is important is we all know the impact of someone who goes through a trial and converts versus someone who just asks to pay. So even though this is a churned customer, so they may have had a trial of some sorts, you want to make sure they go through the correct onboarding and give them a second shot at the trial. Again, this is a little bit of an added cost to you as a business, 
However, it's money you wouldn't otherwise have. Even a 10% recovery from this is a big impact on your bottom line. And from here, cancellation funnels. Now, every company has a sales and marketing funnel at the top. However, very little companies actually do anything when the customer wants to leave. It's really important you do that. You can see here with PDF Converter that they've set up a cancellation funnel in place. One, showing what's the value that this customer will lose if they cancel their plan. But then two, giving optionality about what they can do about it. Do you want to postpone your billing date or do you want a 30% discount? Giving these different options actually helps to serve as a survey to your customer base as well. If you tend to see that 90% of your customers who are churning are opting for the discount, then maybe your pricing is a bit too high and that's something you should reconsider. Having cancellation funnels is a really, really powerful way to one, give your customers the autonomy and freedom to cancel, preventing further chargebacks, but then two, making sure you can improve your deflection rate. And now what's deflection rate? So deflection rate is the number of customers who try to churn, but you prevent from doing so. This is a big number that isn't really commonly spoken about, but is starting to get picked up as more and more SaaS businesses into the market. The another metric you want to look at when it comes to churn is look at your customer's lifetime value. Lifetime value is made up of a few different elements, including retention, and you want to make sure you can bump that up as much as possible. A, having 10 customers who last for a month versus having five customers who last for two months has the same net revenue gain for you as a business with the added benefit of you've got more reliability if you can keep your customers over for a longer time. And finally, you want to look at your involuntary churn rate. How many customers are you losing due to bad tooling in place? Maybe it's time to look at a different uh, payment solution for your company. Now, I really appreciate you all taking time out of your busy days um, to listen today. The three things you want to leave here today with, it's making sure you capture as many payments as possible. Take control of your chargeback rate problem as well. Don't just rely on third-party tools. And then determine the main cause of your customer churn. Doing so, you'll be able to determine the best strategy specific to your customer and products. Now finally, Paddle is the all-in-one SaaS commerce solution. So everything I discussed today is tooling that's in place in Paddle already. We even have other features such as SaaS metrics, um, different customer billing support uh, availability, and things like um, localized currencies worldwide. Please do get in touch afterwards if you're interested to learn more. Also, if you go to our website, you'll find a number of different case studies. We cover a range of different topics from improving conversion rates um, in a way that helped double the sales of a website or the way to helping reduce chargebacks and reduce churn. Well, with that said, really appreciate you joining. Thanks again for listening. We'll take it off to questions.